I think with um, climate impacts happening faster and more intense pace, there has been ever more attention to the level of injustice that is happening uh, around the world. And we know that the impacts hit the, the poorest and the most vulnerable the hardest. Uh, and the system that has disadvantaged them for so long is actually now creating a whole other life-threatening uh, reality for them. And so I think climate justice, something that in a way, I think had been wished away or hoped away or ignored is now on the center stage. And I think that's great. And we have a great panel here um, to discuss this. We have Ayaka Militasa, who is from South Africa, uh, who is active there uh, as a climate activist, working there with the African Climate Alliance, uh, and also looking at how to reduce emissions and draw attention to that in South Africa working with others around the world. We have Gonzalo Munoz from uh, Triciclos, who's also been the high-level champion uh, from the last COP uh, in Chile, um, but is also, uh, he's co-founded and runs Triciclos, which is one of the most recognized Latin American companies in the circular economy and recycling. We have Henrietta Four, who, Four, who is the executive director of UNICEF, and who's been working for many, many years to champion economic development and education and health and humanitarian uh, assistance and disaster uh, relief uh, around the world. Welcome. And we have um, Walter Sinchez from Industrial, which is, he's the general secretary. It's the largest industrial trade union in the world. Being fo you're focused on future of work in the context of the fourth industrial revolution uh, and artificial intelligence, and I think you also have a good sense of the reality of workers. Um, so I'm very pleased to have you here as well. So just to get us uh, rolling here a little bit, I think um, you know climate justice is an all-encompassing term, and I'm hoping today that we can go in and see what it means for different people here in the room. Um, to some, it's the injustice of the fact that the impacts are already happening um, and the need to scale up and uh, raise the level of ambition and holding those who have caused the, pro the problem actually liable and responsible for that. To others, it's about making sure that the transformation to a zero carbon economy is just and that there is a just transition uh, for those who have built our economy uh, and who deserve uh, a just future. And for others, it can be about just making sure that those, that, that if there's climate policy going into effect, that it's not those most impacted by climate change and who are, who are actually the hardest hit are not asked to pay the bill uh, for climate policies as well. So I think, you know, there's so much engagement around the world from, uh, you know, uh, People's Summit on Rights, Cumulant and Human Survival last year, where 200 organizations have come together, human rights and climate organizations, to the activities uh, of students, workers, indigenous peoples on this, um, to litigation, as I mentioned. Um, so I wanted to just start with a very broad question for each of our panelists. Um, and maybe, Aka, I'll start with you, which is what climate justice means for you. Um, what climate justice means for you, for me, I'm actually take the politics out of this question. For me, as being South African, I'm a very indigenous person. So if climate, what climate justice means for me is that we're finally giving Mother Earth the voice it deserves. We're finally going to actually acknowledge that we've taken so much from her and then it's time for us to actually give back because I'm very religious as well because God, I believe that God has given us this planet and it's our duty to actually take care of it and make sure that it is the way we, we found it or actually better yet leave it in a better state for the future generations to come. So climate justice means just finally giving Mother Earth the voice because the environment is voiceless and it's our um, chance for us to talk for the environment and also make sure that it gets what it deserves. How about you, Gonzalo? Um, well, uh, d definitely for me it's about uh, first recognizing that we have made a big mistake and that mistake is generating a crisis that is affecting mostly the, the most vulnerable, those that are, have, have less capability of adapting. Second, uh, it's about uh, not doing it again, not doing any, um, not continue doing the same mistake and, and, and finally also correcting the, the error. Uh, I think that that connects me directly that in order to have the, the capacity of 
having those three reflections, uh, we need a lot more empathy. So I think that part of the problem, part of the injustice, or what it means climate justice for me, is to uh, connect the leaders of the world with the level of the crisis. Most of the people that are taking the decisions, most of the people that are signing the documents are not necessarily the ones, neither that are gonna suffer, are suffering the, the consequences, but also probably those that are somehow uh, acting, uh, thinking that they will be capable of adapting all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that uh, climate justice connects me directly to empathy. Henrietta. Hmm. <clears throat> This past year for us was the 30th anniversary of the Convention on the Rights of the Child. And justice is usually based in rights, what you think is your right. For children, what we've said as a world is that there's a right to clean air and there's a right to a clean environment to grow up. So there should be a clean Mother Earth to walk upon. There should be clean water to drink. There should be clean air to breathe. And, uh, what we often see is that there's a sense of an intergenerational climate injustice, that we who have gone before have um, had the benefits of a cleaner world, and that what we are passing on is one that is less clean, and thus, that's an injustice. Thank you. And Walter. Well, I would say that uh, climate justice is exactly the opposite what we have in the world today. Uh, because if we consider people like ourselves here in Davos, mm -hmm. people that uh, fly over the world, people that uh, ride in combustion engine cars, people that have the level of consumption that we have, uh, generate the gases that impact climate, climate uh, uh, heating in the world, we're not the ones that are having to flee their homes on fire because of droughts or because of floods. So that's not justice at all. Um, we represent workers which are uh, impacted by um, transition, energy transition, for example, or for energy sources. Um, and most of these workers in communities are constantly left behind because there are no policies for that. We're advocates for a just transition, which is a concept that uh, is supposed to bring together uh, business, uh, governments, communities, and workers to try to find out a just transition for um, uh, industries that are there, sustaining communities and, and, and households for decades, for generations. And uh, of course, we're ready to harness the, the new green jobs that are, uh, that are uh, coming to, to place. But of course, we may not leave behind communities that are dependable on this wealth generator for generations. Thank you. So communities, empathy, Mother Earth, um, I think that those are, that's a good place to start and to actually move it away from Politics. So thank you for starting with that, because I think this is something that's so much deeper and so much more important uh, than politics. Maybe if you could tell folks a little bit about what, what, your, what your journey has been. Um, I think your experience in South Africa and your own community um, would be really of, of interest um, to let people know kind of where, what are you experiencing um, and how in your interactions also with others, how, you, how that experience happens. Um, so I became a climate justice activist about two to three years ago after a drought uh, that hit the Western Cape severely affected my community and my direct family. And since my mom is a farmer, we relied heavily on um, agriculture and animals to so actually income. So that was very hard for me to see my mom suffering and struggling so hard to make ends meet. And I could just see it around my community as well. Um, I live in a community where um, we're very poverty stricken. So when you see people that are already struggling to actually buy food for the day, having to pay for water, it was very bad because it asks us, is this really the way that we should live? And to actually ask ourselves is, are these people that are actually living this way the ones that caused this whole problem? So I just knew that I needed to act. And that's when I kind of went to the internet and I found out the real cause or the root cause of this was climate change. So I was very, like mind blown at that moment. I even developed a little bit of climate anxiety or climate depression where I should 
like wake up and then you just have this a lot of information in your mind but you also don't know who to tell that information to and then you don't know how to feel because you feel like the world is ending and no one is actually listening to you. So that's why I decided to actually join environmental organizations and join the African Climate Alliance, which is the youth-led affinity group where the youth of South Africa, predominantly the Western Cape, protest every single term for climate injustice in South Africa. Um, we are based off of the Fridays for Future movement, but in South Africa, attaining education is very hard, so we couldn't really afford to protest every single Friday. So we did it termly on the last day of school where kids are actually free and just to raise more awareness, and it's been effective, but the government hasn't actually been doing much on that. So yeah, that's my story. <laughs> It's great that you're here. Um, <laughs> thank you. So thank you for making it all the way here. And I'll come back and see what you think about the level of justice at Davos. Because um, I think that would be interesting to have a fresh perspective from someone who is coming here. I wanted to dive more into the just transition piece as well. Because I think this is something, maybe you can help us um, go a level deeper. Kind of what, what does it look like? What does it feel like? Any examples that you want to bring forward for people to know about? Well, unfortunately, we don't have many examples, mm. uh, but we have some very significant ones. Uh, I would mention uh, Germany, that they phased out the, the mining of coal, um, that uh, the government agreed on putting together 40 billion euros in the next 10 years to, um, to invest in, in new business for those communities affected, to train uh, and retrain workers, and also the companies pay the share of this. And, and I would say that, you know, that's a, a pretty uh, good initiative now from uh, the European uh, Commission on the Green, the green Deal, yeah. uh, which is supposedly to put um, 25 billion euros to, into programs that uh, enables just transition, which is basically uh, a process in which, um, I mean, mostly, uh, uh, communities or workers that are affected by the, the, the fossil fuel industries, oil, gas, and, and, and coal, basically, um, to uh, have an opportunity of changing the business, reconversion of these industries, and also retrain the workers. And of course, uh, uh, I would say that um, the companies, especially the Seven Sisters of Oil, those should be the ones that to, should take more of the burden yeah. of these costs. Huh? Because if we see, for example, the reaction in, uh, of the Gilets Jaunes in, in, in France, it all sparked was because of the carbon tax. So um, I think it's not fair to, 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 to share the costs like this. So yeah. the, the population, again, having to pay the burden to remediate the damage of the climate while for hundreds of hundred years the, the oil companies um, benefited from that. Gonzalo, let's turn to Chile. I mean, I think both as someone who comes from Chile and has been living there and has been, I mean, the, the inequities that have occurred and, and also when you hear about a just transition or I like to call it socially just climate policy where you don't have the lower income having to pay, you know, what, what are your thoughts about how to move forward on that? Um, what do you think we, ne we need, business needs to be doing or what you're, you're thinking about in how to find a way forward to, to bring cohesion instead of division? Uh, well, I absolutely agree in terms of what Walter has mentioned. Uh, we need to find a way not to uh, have the same type of problem that we faced in, the, in France, for example. In Chile, we have had a lot of unrest during the last months, uh, most of them asking for, so, uh, most of them related to social demands, but we, we perfectly know that, that behind that there are also a lot of uh, environmental justice demands that need to be solved and covered as well. So I think that uh, Chile might be a, a good example of a, of a country that needs to tackle both elements at the same time. There's no way we can even use all of the potential in terms of, for example, renewables, or use, using the same example that Walter said, uh, Chile is moving out of coal in the generation uh, of, energy, of energy or electricity uh, due to the conditions that we have in the country. We're mostly a, 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 a country that are, is, is importing uh, the, the fossil fuels, and, and we have such a great uh, opportunity in terms of renewables. All of that must be done in a way that it includes 
not only the labor force, not only the workers, but also has to be incorporated in the culture of the of the citizens, in the in the in the way people consume. So we have a massive challenge mm. uh, for people to understand that this not only has to be good for them and therefore uh, and therefore generate the condition for that to be uh, absolutely uh, evident, but at the same time people asking for it because they understand that we, that's the only way that we can uh, build a common future. In that, in that sense, uh, in Chile, I would say most of the uh, most of the interest and the force from the business sector is coming from multinationals, much more than national companies. But at the same time, we have a good force of uh, uh, SMEs. Uh, in Chile, it's one of the countries with more certified B corporations per capita in the world. Uh, there are more than uh, 150 B corps, most of them small and medium-sized companies that are all of them committed to net zero emissions in 2030. So those companies are also mobilizing more ambition even than the big uh, multinationals uh, because we understand that that's uh, not only the the right thing to do is also the smart thing to do. And taking into account the inequalities and, and how much of this uh, is, is part of the reality of a country like Chile and many others, we, I, I would like to, 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 take, uh, to bring to the, to the conversation uh, a case that we were talking about. Uh, just Ezequiel Stai just passed away. He was the leader of the uh, rack pickers in Latin America. Uh, an amazing force of people, uh, ab absolutely underprivileged, that has been able to show not only to the business sector but also to the politicians that there's no way that we can achieve uh, sustainability and sustainable development with, without incorporating everybody in, into, into the path. And therefore, there is also a need of incorporating all of those people that have had no possibility of somehow uh, seeing the results of the level of development that we have had in South America. Let's honor him. And let Let's honor that Ezequiel, he's... because he represents very well what we can call climate justice mm -hmm. for, for Latin America, at least. I think I want to come back to this, how we incorporate everyone into the path, <coughs> and also this question of um, who, who pays? Who's the responsible one? Because there's a lot of different pieces here. Um, but Henry, I want to come. This year has been an amazing year for children in climate change. And I'm just curious kind of what the experience has been at, at UNICEF and what you are specifically focusing on um, there to try and bring the rights of children uh, and climate more to the fore. <laughs> Uh, well, thank you, Jennifer. As you know, this has been a year where the young's voice is everywhere in climate. It's, it's exciting, it's thrilling, it's bringing hope, but then we also, we can't let there be disappointment. So the twin uh, that we have for this is mental health for young. Mm -hmm. One of the things that they tell us is that sometimes they get really depressed and it's part of your story. Yeah. So we want to be sure that we're listening also to um, what they want, what they see in their own home communities, and that we um, all band together and do something about it. This shouldn't just be words. This shouldn't just be advocacy. Uh, we talked about the word, instead of an activist, an actionist, mm -hmm. someone who takes action in their neighborhoods. And that's what the young want to do. Mm. So as we hear from young all over the world, uh, some are digitally connected. And those that are speak up about uh, checking with each other on what's going on in their own communities, what can be done, what are the solutions, uh, do we have a flood or a drought here or there. When they are part of the half of the world that's not connected, they are dealing at the very basic level with how to keep your crop going. There isn't enough water in the wells in some of the Sahel. The water level is down to 10% of where it should be. It's creating um, real fights between those that are agriculturalists and those that are herders. So it's creating conflict in communities. It's making the social fabric of the world in many of these communities begin to come apart. So for UNICEF, we know that there are some of these places in the world that become healing places. 
One are safe spaces for children and young people. Some are communities that band together and they look after the nature and the community around them. Others are um, to be able to speak on international stages about what's going on in their world. But all of it is very important because they have voice. They have agency. They're going to do something about it. So I think for all of us coming out of WEF, the key is action. Mm -hmm. We have to take action. We have to agree to take action. We cannot let this um, continue. And for um, those that are the poorest, those are, that are the least equal in the world, it will be the most difficult for them. So if we can reach out to them and help them, we will all feel um, that we at least have contributed a bit more to our planet. <laughs> Like on this action side, I mean, what's your message to leaders here in Davos? What do you want them to take home in the action side of things with them? Um, I really want them to know that we see that these big CEOs or big companies um, are using tax havens to actually dodge paying taxes, and those taxes could be used in actually lessening inequalities and actually creating more jobs in Africa. So we want really to hold them accountable and make, them, make sure that when we live here in Davos, we live here knowing that we're actually going to be doing something. As you said, um, we, there's no more time for words. And if we've been saying this, there's no more time for words, but yet we see no action. So it could be really great if we see more young people holding their governments accountable, holding big corporate businesses accountable and just trying to see the transition to 100% renewable energy become a true factor instead of just theory. Does that resonate? Do you think you have a sure. partner in... <laughs> you're heading to South Africa sure. here? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, uh, well I, the, the way I think is, is of course, um, uh, the whole society has to be involved in the, in the transition. Uh, we as unions, we used to say there are no jobs in a dead planet. So we're conscious about our, our responsibilities and we representing our members. So our day-to-day our, uh, -day job is to negotiate and to celebrate deals. Mm. And so one of the tools that we, we pursue and, and we achieve with some companies, uh, some multinational companies, so I wouldn't say not all of them are bad guys. Yeah? So um, we have some global framework agreements with some companies. For example, uh, energy companies like any from Italy, like EDF, Electricité de France, in which they commit themselves to just transition uh, proposition along the guidelines of the ILO. And so they take responsibility for not only for their impact or if they change their energy source, but also for the whole supply chain. And also we have a global framework agreement with Renault the, the auto company, a French auto company, that uh, basically the whole process of transformation in the industry is committed that they'll, it will be negotiated with the unions at local level. And I think that um, that's basically what we need. I mean, we, we need to find a common ground that you know, all the actors are, are, are put in place because uh, left to their own devices. I mean, I know, uh, for example, a, a bad example of an energy company in Colombia, for example, that uh, from one day to another, of course it was not from one day to another, but the announcement for the public was one day to another, they changed their energy source out of coal. So they were going green, which is a good thing. So their shares in the same day went up, but the result of that was 5,000 fired workers mm. with no uh, uh, no uh, severance pay, nothing for them. So the whole community in Colombia affected in a country with no, no regulation, no taxation for companies. So we need uh, governments to act, like, like she said, mentioned before, we need action from the governments to regulate to taxation, in taxation so that we can uh, level and, you know, and we have the resources to finance the transition. I would like to jump into Go that, for it. as, um, as Balte mentioned it. Nice. I think that one of the uh, elements that we have to consider, of course, is the financial sector. Mm. And not only the financial sector as a general element, what about the pension funds? So it's our money, it's our pensions that most of the times are being also invested in, not only in climate injustice, but also in inequality. Mm. So what's our role? What's the role of the of, of, of the uh, younger population in terms of also start mobilizing that, of course, 
uh, asking uh, an opinion about pension, maybe it's not the right time, but, but also in the purchase power. Good. Companies are also sometimes uh, positioning themselves like we're going to do what the customers, what the, what the consumers ask us to do. And on a sudden, uh, I think that it comes to a time when we have to realize that all citizens of the world have a certain capacity of asking or voting with their dollar, with their money, in order to create the world that we require. And we, and I think that we require a, a massive change in terms of divestment in our pension fund, divestment from the financial sector, and somehow that must come also from the citizen, must come also from the consumer side. Yes, yeah, so I wanted to um, bring up the fact there's this wonderful term in development, co-benefits. But this is absolutely an area where there can be co-benefits on all of it, so that the company is doing the right thing by the workers, they're doing the right thing by their communities, they're doing the right thing for the next generation. And we see it in many of the innovations that companies bring to us. So about half of the world's vaccines um, go through UNICEF. And what you have to have for vaccines is a cold chain. Well, if you have little refrigerators out everywhere in the villages and there's no electricity, well, we have solar panels now for all of them. That innovation comes because of partners in the business community. So it, we're all in this together, and I think that the more that we can think about co-benefits, then we'll be better off and we'll get there faster. We think there's a lot of acceleration that can happen as we're getting toward the sustainable development goals. And for climate justice, we think innovations are going to be very much a part of it mm -hmm. in air, water, land, mm -hmm. all of it. I mean, this all makes a lot of sense, but it's not happening at the scale and speed that's needed, right? So the question for me is, why, why isn't it happening at the scale and speed needed? Um, why is it that you still have so many people who are left behind who are not incorporated into the decisions? What does need to happen so that um, we get that shift? So because I think if it continues in the way that we've been going, there's going to continue to be those types of announcements because the, spe the speed and scale of the change is so great. But even if the speed and scale is great, there's still going to be a lot of climate victims. And um, so wh where, where are the barriers? Where are the, what are the, why isn't this happening faster? What do you think? Um, I feel like that actually touches a bit with what I said previously about um, um, big CEOs of big companies and big corporates are actually dodging paying taxes. And that's actually, I feel like, slowing down the rate of um, implementing the SDG goals. And especially in South Africa, we see that Coming from colonization, um, a lot of black people or people of color have not been involved in decision making. So when now they are given the platform to be involved in the decision making, there's a lot of corruption in our system. And that corruption is actually stopping us from actually moving forward to renewable energy since South Africa is very big on coal. Yeah. And I feel like the reason why most people aren't divesting from coal is because they want to suck it for all it's got. They still see that it still has a lot of money in it. And they know it's bad for it and they know that it's there is going to be a time for them to move away from coal, but they still want to make sure that they profit the most out of coal before they actually move on. So it'd be very great that people make, take more action right now. We understand that you want uh, more profit, but how good is that profit going to be? I heard earlier from um, Prince Charles' speech is um, that you can attain all this extra wealth, but um, how will you use this wealth in the future when there is actually no planet or the planet is dying already. So we really have to take those in, in, in consideration and weigh the odds. Is this like attaining more profit really worth it in terms of actually building a more sustainable future? And is this forum is about a more cohesive and inclusive future? So indeed, the, the very basis of having GDP and profit be the basis of so much of the way world's economies are run, that and the, the role of the big CEOs and all of that, I mean, Gonzalo, what do you think? What do you think about that? What do we need to do about that? Well, it, I, I, I agree that we're talking about the economic incentives, right? Uh, unfortunately, uh, what brought us here is most of the time realizing that the economy is mobilized just with one factor is the financial, and not realizing that we live in a finite world, that we need to make the economy visible, uh, feasible, not, not only for the short term, but for the long term, and not only for a few, but for other, for all. Uh, so, so I think that realizing that uh, we live in a finite world requires a level of consciousness that 
many times we haven't had certain distinctions. And now we're in a moment when this is getting so evident. We have had so much evidence in terms of the level of destruction, the level of inequality, that uh, we're reaching a point where, where we mostly require is courage. Uh, and the courage of certain leaders, not only at the, at the economical level, but also, of course, at the political level. And those leaders are actually uh, erasing. I think that we have had quite a strong change in the last at least one year or maybe in six months where many of the things that we were thinking that will happen somewhere started happening mm -hmm. in a different Of course, all the, the youth movement has been fantastic to allow uh, those distinctions to be much more visible for, for those leaders. Uh, unfortunately, the level of destruction that we're seeing in the world uh, is showing us the same thing. We are crossing the barriers of what is, uh, what is feasible for the world. We, we have uh, crossed certain limits, and therefore I think that in the last year, uh, for many leaders, being business leaders or investors or political leaders, uh, they have seen that now the climate, uh, not only discussion, but the climate action is now absolutely uh, vital. Uh, it's, not, it's not more uh, something that, that they can uh, think about or uh, dream about. Uh, they, they, it's a requirement for any kind of activity. Uh, and we have seen, for example, how the Climate Ambition Alliance is growing worldwide, meaning not only uh, 121 uh, nations that are already committed to net zero emissions in 2050. Uh, it's uh, 398 cities. Uh, we have 700, now more almost 1,000 uh, new leaders, uh, business leaders that committed to net zero emissions by 2050 and $7 trillion committed to that. That, I, I totally agree with you, that is not enough. It's not even fast enough, but it's a, it's a signal that what we have seen in terms of uh, even pressure from the youth is, is allowing us to hopefully gain momentum. I'm just wondering who else should be at the table here as well. It's kind of an odd place to have a discussion about climate justice sitting here in Davos with all of these big CEOs. And I mean, Henry, you work with many people. And if you think about the, the climate justice debate, I mean, who do you think needs to be actually here sitting uh, in this discussion so that their voices are heard? Well, it's the people. It's the people of our planet. Um, you know, in the development world, there are so many humanitarian disasters that occur. Some are natural disasters, so it could be a cyclone that's coming in. It, um, it might be the droughts or the floods. It, uh, climate resilience is a real challenge for our world. Mm -hmm. It is a challenge to farmers, and it's a challenge to urban dwellers. And we are not organized in a way to really capture water well in our cities and to reutilize it well. So I think we're going to have to rethink some of the basic systems in our world and in urban life. What you see among the young of the world is that they all want to be in an urban center. They all want to be very digital. So they want, to, <laughs> they want energy sources, and they want to be in an urban center. That doesn't, um, you know, we're not, we're not set up for it. The other thing that happens uh, is that we see lots of man-made disasters. There's lots of violence, and it's on the increase. And so when people flee their homes, they may leave their livestock behind and everything that they have, and they just run. It's then hard for all of our systems, our support systems to help them. And these are the people who need to have a voice because they're, they, they have so little. Uh, so all of us need to think about how we can help with the justice and the injustice and the inequalities in the world. And that is why uh, having the World Economic Forum and the World Bank this year and the United Nations this year focusing on inequality is a very important issue for all of us to carry in our minds mm -hmm. and in our work. Mm -hmm. You're a farmer's daughter. Um, I mean, and you work with people or you're around people every day. I mean, who else do you think we need to be listening to? Um, I feel like it's the indigenous people. Um, like indigenous people have a close connection to nature. 
and they understand how to utilize nature in the correct way and they've been passing down ways to treat nature for a long time now. So to them, it's almost like they aren't really understanding what's causing the climate change because sometimes we find that people think that the drought is caused by God. Um, the flood is because of God. We find people going to the mountains and praying for God to actually bring back the rain. So I feel like they have to be in this discussion so that they can be able to see that sometimes it's not God. Um, there are people that are causing this, and it's time for them to actually also hold them accountable because what I've seen is they have a lot of resilience. And sometimes that resilience can be bad because it's actually pro is like holding them back from actually standing up for what's really right um, and what they really should be doing. And I feel like other people that should be here are the people that are actually causing these problems, are the people that are actually contributing the most to this problem. Because talking about talking to indigenous people about this is not really going to help because there isn't much that they can do. So the people that are actually causing this problem, the people that have the money and have the means to actually change and like, they'll have a whole paradigm change, change here um, are the people that we need to involve more in this discussion. You mentioned the financial sector. Um, I mean, just to throw a fact out there that, you know, since um, Paris, the 24 bankers who have been coming to Davos invested $1.4 trillion in fossil fuels, although they say they're Paris compliant. Uh, and I think, um, for me, that was, I mean, I kind of knew it, but I found that quite um, a shocking piece. And I guess the question is how to have that, is, the dot, you know, it, I don't know how much it can be a dialogue. Um, what I am seeing more of is people who are actually litigating against some of these companies. And it's not necessarily Greenpeace. It's the city of New York. It's others who are having to pay uh, for the impacts um, who had very little to do with it. And so I guess, I don't know, you know, um, in, in the labor community, you are amazing negotiators. <laughs> and I'm just curious, so you think of these big, big companies, whether they be banks, whether they be the big CEOs that are avoiding taxes that there is this responsibility as you said you know how how do we get that to move forward how do we get them to shift their mindsets and to understand what's at stake and have some empathy um, think about community I mean I guess that's the big question but I'm just curious for your thoughts well uh, first I, I think it's um, sometimes it's not a matter of sensibilization I mean uh, it's a matter of, of their being forced to. So right. that's why we, we all celebrate the Fridays of the Future movement that's putting some the issue in the day-to-day -day lives of, of people. Um, of course, we, we do have a community of business uh, community that it's conscious and, and it's ready to make uh, agreements with us. But it's, uh, we have uh, 54 global agreements only. Of course, they are... They are big companies with big supply chains, so affecting with a big impact uh, in the world. But um, I would say that, uh, of course, we are also trying to address the issues of the, 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 the money in the pension funds. But I mean, it's, it's a limited, you know, what we can do bilaterally, I mean, labor and business community is limited. Right. You know, there is a part that has to be addressed by governments. You know, we just came this week, early this week, with the Oxfam report on inequalities. Yep. So it's outrageous. It's outrageous. So the way that, the, the, you know, the breach among the, the billionaires and the rest of the population of the world, that's outrageous. I mean, we do have the resources. They are there. And the, civil, the civilization in this planet already created the tools for this. That means taxes, which means you have to tax the billionaires so that they can put the money to finance the remediation. And so inequality is, is, uh, is totally linked to the to the climate un injustice. Mm. Yeah, um, I, I was wondering whether you mentioned the man-made disaster. Would it be different if we had more women leadership? Because I think that part of the problem is that probably we men are less capable of identifying the problems that we are not taking care of. Uh, and, I, and I think that that might be also part of the solution. Uh, while I tend to believe, and maybe I'm, I'm wrong, that's something that maybe we can, we can try to discover. Uh, hopefully, more women leaders are capable of joining the commitments, the real commitments, easier than, than men. And, and at the same time, allow us to uh, mobilize ourselves uh, faster. Uh, we, we are actually. Uh, thinking about 
the question of who is missing here, I totally agree that we, we're missing here those that are saying, I'm not willing to join, I'm not willing to sign. Why? Because not signing a commitment for net zero emissions in 2050 is such a massive and concrete uh, communication. Uh, it's very tough to communicate that you are not willing to work towards uh, solving the crisis or uh, answering the request of science, nature, the youth. Uh, so I think that we, we must also be a, li a little bit more confrontative in terms of asking those leaders to really answer the question if they're not willing to, to join such a basic element. Uh, for I think that we are behaving ourselves, and, and, and I'm talking from the business community, as the orchestra of the Titanic. I continue doing our, our work, thinking that we're doing it uh, nice enough. It's the only thing that we know how to do. We continue doing it because it's others' job to solve the problem. And, and that has gotten to an end. And the way you young people are telling the, the elder people in the world that it's enough, uh, please, if, if, you don't, if you're not capable of solving such a massive crisis, then let us do it. I think it's the right provocation that we should be start listening to. Since you mentioned um, empathy, one of the things that we've noticed is that uh, there is a every CEO, every person who's working in a corporation, every government leader is usually in a household, they're usually in a family. And if you begin to show them what happens with, let's say, air pollution on the development of a baby's brain and that it does not actually make the neural connections and they cannot be a, a, a well-formed brain if there's too much air pollution, they all of a sudden begin to think of it differently. So maybe appealing to human hearts is part of the mission that we need to do. Sometimes it is the human being that comes to believe that they should do something about this. They should be net zero. They should do something to help the next generations. I mean, I think, um, I, I think that's the hope. I know whenever I come here, you know, my hope is that I'm not just speaking to a business leader, that I'm speaking to a mother or a father or a grandparent, right? And um, because I think if we only act with our heads, we have all the facts, right? So it's much more, I think, about um, humanity. That's just my own uh, reaction on this. And I, you know, it's, it's interesting. There is actual data that shows that the countries that are led by women or the mayors, the cities that are led by women are further ahead on tackling climate change. Um, same thing in business, probably. And I think that's quite interesting. So I hear tax the billionaires, elect more women, um, which is, uh, and it's Let interesting. Let the youth rule. Let the youth yeah. rule. <laughs> Follow <laughs> science. Follow, Follow science. science. Don't deny. Don't deny, sounds all. Um, and uh, it's interesting because the Fight and Equality Alliance coming into this meeting, uh, actually their main message is to get rid of billionaires. And I think it seems so simple, I mean, or naive, but actually, uh, if you dig below that, I mean, I'm, I'm curious if that speaks something to you, you know, or something to others. Uh, what, what, when you hear that, like, what's, what's behind it? Because I think there's someone who could potentially be on this stage of bringing them into the room. So, you know, uh, Warren Buffett is one of the billionaires that says we need to be more taxed. He's right. one of the, the raising the issue. So he, he has this conscience after some years, of course, but, but yep. he, he's, he's saying, but he come, he's a, 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 in a country with a, a denier who just gave tax exemptions in 2017 that will, are worth in 10 years about $1.5 trillion. So that doesn't solve the problem. No. That increases the inequality. That's not money out there for supporting the communities, for creating greener jobs, for creating reconversion of the industries. So, what I would say to every billionaire in the world, uh, we're facing a decade where we have to solve not only these uh, problems but many others. We're facing a decade that is critical. Uh, I cannot imagine um, a billionaire that couldn't spend their money better than putting into the serve of solving these problems. That would be the best way to uh, generate uh, a, a personal legacy in the world. I, I, I definitely cannot imagine somebody avoiding that responsibility. Hmm. 
definitely even on that point is if you're a billionaire and you're not actually using that money in a cohesive and a good way, what are you really going to do with it? Because you spent all this time attaining this while building it up to getting it to billions, but now you're stuck with all this money. What are you actually going to do with all that money? You don't need that much money as a person. You need it so to that buy could power. Yeah. <laughs> but power would actually make you live longer, so I still have to take that into consideration. <laughs> so, definitely, so definitely people should be using their money as a good way. So yeah, the most responsible way I think billionaires could be using their money is actually investing in actually creating a better society and a more cohesive future. Mm. Ready to show that? Well, I think we're all in this together. Uh, and. Um, Billionaires may well have created uh, extraordinary innovations that have made our world better. So there's smart, there's expertise, there are lots of capacities in everyone. So we should not exclude anyone. We're going to need every brain, every pair of hands, every willing heart to try to solve the many problems that lie before our world. So I would say be inclusive. Maybe that's a just final round from you all, because I think this is actually, um, you know, to, to, to have more climate justice happen, what would be the one or two things, words, not things, what's the word that you're left with or the feeling that you're left with? Because I think what's striking to me about this panel is the policy stuff is there. We actually know about where we need to tax. We know the inclusiveness that we need to bring in. We know we need to move money. We know all of that. But what you've all focused on actually is much deeper than that. And um, so I'm just curious to give you each kind of the final word if you were to say what well, climate justice, what we need in order to achieve it and make progress on it. What, what would that be? I'll start with you. Well, I would say inclusiveness uh, in, in a way of, uh, you know, we, in, in here we, you, we hear a lot about stakeholders. So, so everybody which is interested and impacted should be heard, should have a place on the table to negotiate uh, the transition. I mean, um, we have uh, uh, 10 years to achieve the sustainable uh, develop, development goals. Um, and uh, so, it won't happen if we leave the market rule by itself. So we have to have a common joint bargaining table with all the stakeholders around. Inclusiveness. Tell us. Well, we have enough reasons, evidence, science, even good business cases. Mm. So I believe that this is the best possibility and opportunity for any business person in the world to transcend their company and their brand through solving problems of society. So I Tran transcendence. Sure. No reason why not to. <coughs> Henry. Oh, it's let, let's get to work together. Let's roll up our sleeves and let's get to work. Let's solve this. Okay. Um, in my opinion, I feel like we should actually talk to people and more predominantly people in power and just take the politics and all the money out of this and just speak to them as people and speak to them and try to find out what would you do if you were in the situation of another person. How would you think if you were actually home starving with no water, with no light, with no electricity, just thinking, am I going to make it through this day? So just try to take the finances out of it and try to, to appeal to the human heart. Jennifer, may I add to that? If um, ministers and business people try to look at it from a child's point of view, mm. they will do this. They will look at the human heart. Mm. So maybe centering it around a child would be a good place to start. We're going to end with a heart. <laughs> and uh, thank you each, uh, for each of your, your thoughts and, and your experience. And um, let's go forward with more heart and um, get to work. Thank you.